I'm Melissa Ojeda, Marketing and Public Relations Manager for Grand Canyon Conservancy, the official nonprofit partner of Grand Canyon National Park. We work hand in hand with the Park Service to provide educational opportunities and digital programming to keep you connected to Grand Canyon. Thanks to your ongoing support, we're able to share this new series, History Behind the Arts, providing you an in-depth look at the Cultural Demonstrator Program at Grand Canyon. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the Cultural Demonstrator Program Coordinator, Grace Lilly. Hi, thank you for joining us today. We have the pleasure of talking with Dorothy and Emerson Ami, Hopi and Tewa Potters, joining us from their home in the village of Tewa on First Mesa in Northeast Arizona. They work as a couple creating handmade pottery, carrying on generations of Hopi tradition. Thank you for joining us today, Dorothy and Emerson. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Dorothy, can you share a little bit about yourself and what drew you into pottery? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, pottery, when I was young, I didn't have a love for it. I was a teenager, and you know how teenagers are. They we would rather play ball and uh, run around, hang out with friends. But in the corner of our dining room table, my, my cousin Mark and my grandmother early would be making pottery. And even as a young child, I would watch them. And my grandma would push early, her name was early, would give me some uh, clay and I'd just make little animals and you know run and take off. And, and I never really thought of it as a big part of my life like I do today, but as I grew older and did other types of jobs. Um, I became a preschool teacher, and I enjoyed I enjoyed um, you know teaching teaching young um, young kids. And one day, Mark, my cousin, who was who was also a big part of my life, was my mentor. His name's Mark Tubble. He came to my home. He had just bought a mobile home, and he didn't have like. He didn't have the water and electricity hooked up yet. So he would bring his duffel bag to come wash and, you know, come have coffee. And he would bring his clay and uh, sit there and drink coffee. So it was kind of like that, how it kind of started with us. And I, you know, just by watching him, I started to, um, he, he, he told me, you know, try it, you know, try try to make something and it became it, it became a ritual almost every day for us that he would come over and wash and we would sit down and we make our coffee and position my 19 inch color tv with no remote to days of our lives and <laughs> make pottery and and that kept going on and uh one day he encouraged me to not go back to work because it was during the summer and he said, I think you can make it. And he was pointing to the pottery. And he said, if you, if you don't go back to your work, if you don't go back to um, teaching, I, I want to propose an idea to you. He said, I think you can make it. He said, just by watching you. I'll, this is what I propose. He said, I'll show you everything you need to know, which you're already, already learning. I'll take you to my shows. I'll take you and me and introduce you to the people I work with. Um, and so he said, I'll, I'll give you time to think about it. And me, you know, being like naive and I was young and uh, I, I enjoyed teaching. I didn't, I, 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 start, I started doing the pro and con of it, you know, because the biggest thing was no two week paycheck, <laughs> which, you know, you, you have to make a living somehow. And, and then thinking about, wow, if I really do this, I'm gonna have to what they say, hustle, you know, and get good at this and and all, all these other things. It was just like a fresh start. 
So in the end, I decided to to take him up on his offer. And so it began. <laughs> um, I was making little, little tiny pots, miniature pots, and I use I call them my bow and hope drama pots because remember we were Something watching like watching days of our lives and uh, making pottery. So all those miniatures out there are my I call my drama pots, my soap pot, soap soap pot. And it, it it brought me a little wealth, you know, like five dollars, you know, can you believe that or ten bucks? Um but when when it was time to really say, Okay, no job, you know, he encouraged me to start making big pots, bigger pots, and that was the challenge for me. Um and I did, you know, I started making big pots. And along came with the bigger pots. Was the bigger challenges and the the frustrations, the emotions, um, because I would I would make them, I would hand coil them, let them dry, and it was it, during the sanding. You know, I would go through it. It was the walls were too thin. Or if I got to the end with the firing, then it would blow up or it would crack. And I, at the time, I just felt like, what, what kind of um, demon doing this to me? Because it was frustrating. I would cry. I would cry because I slaved over this pot and and. In, as I grew older, I found out, you know, that, that it's just part of it. It's part of life and growing with learning with this pottery. Working, I'm just going to go back to work. And he would, he would say, uh, no, you know, he would kind of get a little tough with me. And he goes, no, you have to sit back down and, and stick your hands back into the clay and had it, you know, that that's how he he would say it to me. So I I continued to make it. I continued to make it. And one day, um oh and Mark was pretty well known in the art world with his pottery. And he he told me, you know, uh, I wanna invite you to go to the to the um Indian market with me in Santa Fe. And I was, I was like, I always heard about stories that he would come back and tell, and um, even even his trips around the world of where he went, you know, and that was exciting to me, and all the things that he was doing to invite me, you know, I I felt real special, and and of course he promised he would take me to his show, so that was one of the first ones I went to. Um, and I was excited, I was excited, and he told me, you know, make some pots, you know, you never know, you might sell. So, you know, I got busy too, you know, I, I didn't really make a whole lot, you know, I just, I was more excited about going to see what this show was about, because I've never been to an art show before. That was my very first art show I went to. So we went, and it was exciting. It, it was ex an exciting weekend. Um, the first evening we arrived, we went to dinner with some people in a, in a quaint, uh, fancy uh, cafe. And I didn't really know, I got introduced to them, but what I was really, really worried about more so was all the silverware that were on each side of the plate <laughs> because I've never been abroad or anywhere before you know and never spending a night anywhere for a long period of time just always at home and he he was having conversation with them and I would and then the wait waiters kept bringing these these food the food um they were, I, I guess that's how eating goes, you know, you get the, 
you get the uh, appetizer, then you get the salad, then you get the uh, main course. the main course, and all the time I was just worried about which utensil went with which plate. You know, what what's this for? And, but I kept using the same one. But in the end, I mean, in the end, our main course was a little piece of meat and three little red potatoes and two slivers of carrots and. Me being a Hopi, Hopi lady, big Hopi lady, I'm like, who is like this? You know, where we want fried potatoes and a bigger piece of meat and uh, a tortilla. <laughs> so, you know, that was already my experience with that. And in the end, we left, you know, we said our, our, our see you later, you know, tomorrow and all that. And we left the cafe, walk, walking down the sidewalk. I was so full. And Mark, I, I I looked at Mark and I said, who were they anyway? You know, who were those people? And he said, oh, my friends. And they own the Ford, Ford Motor Company. <laughs> and I stood there and I'm like, oh my God, are you serious? And he said, yeah, you know, and it was just like nonchalant to him. I was like freaking out, like, wow, I was sitting with the owners of the Ford Motor Company and I didn't even say anything to them, you know, <laughs> I didn't interrupt them because they were talking about art. And he said that they had purchased some of his pottery to go in their main um, buildings and they were friends. So, you know, it. this is the weekend that I really found out who my cousin was because to me, he was my mentor and my cousin and it was a different feeling, you know, going there with him and finding him out because the next day we we had to get up early, um, really, really early, get to his booth. As we were walking, I saw a line of people and it seemed to be like a line for coffee or maybe a breakfast burrito, but come to find out, as we got closer, he said, this is my booth. And there was a long line of people. And I was like, wow, what's going on? And so we had all the pottery and he goes, where's the table? Put the table up. And I was like, oh my God. I felt like a little puppy. I always felt like a little puppy wagging my tail behind him because I didn't want to miss a beat. But um I, I forgot the table and I was like, oh, okay, one X on my, on my student rating, I guess. And, and I, I said, we didn't bring it. So we had the pots that were wrapped. So we were really Indian style. We just, we just unwrapped the pots and threw the sarapis on the, on the uh, ground and we put the pots there. I mean, we we could we could go and run at a table. I mean, these people were waiting. Um, and then the, there was a there was a guy. He was just waving a paper in the air. And I'm first. I'm first. You know. I was. Everything was just so like wow to me. And he said, "Okay." And so he got the and Mark got the paper. He called him up and he explained to him about the pots. And then Mark told me, he said, okay, however they pay, I'm giving it to you. And you take the pot, wrap it up, and give it back to them. And I said, okay. So I was the assistant, so I couldn't mess up. So it it was like that, you know, he, if they wanted to buy it, it was in their price range, they would take it. And I tell you, within less than an hour, we had no pots. And these people were already rushing over with their jewelry cases. And I was like, what do we do now? You no, know, and he the uh, blanket and there was still people waiting in line and he made an announcement to them saying, if any of you still want a pot, you know, leave your information on this paper. So they were doing that and he was like, how much did we make? And I said, I don't know. And I had this little, rinky dinky calculator and I was trying to add it all up and I couldn't believe the first total. I said, oh, this isn't right. I have to do it again. So I did it again. It came out the same, but 
I couldn't believe it. And then I did it. I added up again the third time. And by this time, he was anxious. And I, well, how much did we make? You know, kind of in that tone. And I said, um, this is how much it said. Uh, it says the calculator. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's about right, you know. And I sit there with my mouth hanging way down to my feet and I just, my eyes wide open, if you can imagine that, $50,000 in less than an hour. And at that moment, I knew that I was going to really become otter. <laughs> and then all day we were, he took me to meet um, his friends that were potters from different places um, there. I met Charles King and um, just a lot of, uh, just a Dora Sepe and uh, Russell Sanchez. Um, you know, I met a lot of these potters. Um, and it was to me that day, you know, I always explain it as art heaven because I was so, everything was just so beautiful and the art was just overwhelming and my head was spinning and I wanted to just get home and create and create and create. I, I, I literally got bit that weekend. So, but when I got home, <laughs> I was too tired to even do anything. But through it all, um, the first show that Mark encouraged me to try was the uh, Hopi show that always happens in July, uh, the first weekend in July at um, the Museum of Northern Arizona and Flagstaff. And I, I had, I, I got all, I got all done. You know, I, I finished all my pots. I set them on the stove, and you know, I was letting him look at them, and he just encouraged me, you know, to to go to the show, do well, and he wasn't going to accompany me. So I was really like out on my own. And I remember only selling one pot that day. It, was, it had a hummingbird on it. It was feeding off a, a, a flower. And he, um, his name was Jerry Snow. And up to this day, every time I see Jerry, he brings that pot to show me. Brings me to tears, but you know that was one of my first shows, and he he cherished that cherishes that pop. But all weekend, that was basically what I saw. I got discouraged again, um, and then after that, you know, just just continuing to get more comfortable doing shows and um, stuff. Are uh, him? He continued to mentor me until 2018 when. Uh, we he passed on and to this day you know it he's still a big part of my life even though he's not here um yeah he, he left me with the best gift and i know that i will carry it on amazing it's a great memory to know of mark and emerson um i'd love to hear a little bit about what drew you into the arts and if you had a mentor or someone who inspired you as well good morning everybody i'm name's emerson i'm corn clan from three different tribes, Laguna, Tewa, and Hopi. For me, Mark was not, was a mentor, but he wasn't really kind of that close with me with, uh, as Dorothy was. But he, he saw a lot of talent in my, the work that I was doing, he inspired me to do a lot more different things. And every now and then he would um, see something that I was making and say you should try something like this or try this other other type of pot and there's always times i was like one step ahead of him and I said, yeah i've done that already and but he kept kept pushing me to try different things which was um, pretty great but when i got started of course just like dorothy's story start from grandmother grandma's made pots and i was residing with them here in palaka and went on high school you know, art class there. Tried doing the wheel stuff with ceramic work, but I couldn't do that because I already knew how to do um, the traditional style of the hand coiling. As time went on, I just kind of left it alone. Didn't, didn't really mess anymore. And 
what really brought it to life was when we first, Doris and I first met. I actually met her standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona, but not the corner, but a corner. <laughs> and we didn't know we were going to get into this pottery stuff. And as time went on, it starts seeing that it was kind of a calling. But when she first started, I was now really getting into my career as a law enforcement officer. So I had the paycheck coming in every two weeks, which was fine. And what pushed me a little bit more was Dorothy kept making pots and just they'd just be sitting around on the table and not getting done. So I started kind of helping her out. And she talks about the sanding part is what I was doing. I was doing a lot of more of the sanding and lo and behold, I started molding myself. And from there, we just moved on. And up to the, up to this date, we still do the same. We still have pots sitting on the table. <laughs> and mm. when we really get into making the pots, I mean, we're just zoned out. We just concentrate on what we're doing. Just molding one pot at a time, we're doing several at a time and then set them down, move to the next one or different phases that we do. But I really enjoy what I'm doing. I did this, I guess, probably maybe about for probably about maybe 15 years. But as I said earlier, I was a police officer. So during my off duty time, I would call this as use this as my stress reliever. And, but I would put more stress on ourselves, especially we're going to go to shows because we're burning the midnight oil, trying to get things done. And then we got to fire and then when it's done we got pack up and travel well it's taken us all over uh, especially with demonstrations which is we love doing and sharing our talent especially meeting everybody out there that don't really know what really pottery is because we've had a lot of folks come up and say it's just wood this looks like wood we say no it's clay and we do have two different forms of clay a yellow and a gray that we use so and it just brings out a lot of creativity when we start together and like i said mark kind of pushed me to try things differently which was we always tease each other and i he never took me to any place like dorothy <laughs> he took dorothy i was still waiting for him to take me to idaho for uh, classes that he does up there but um, unfortunately, she said he passed on, but I did finally get to go. And now Dorothy and I are doing the traveling and well, we were doing the traveling until this pandemic happened. But we're glad that we had a chance to work at the Canyon our first year, which was um, New Year's Eve weekend. We didn't know what to expect. Being a major holiday, we thought it wasn't gonna be anybody around. But that that changed that first day because the, you guys have a counter at the door and we asked, I can't remember who it was, we asked how many people that came through. It's over 10,000. <laughs> and we had, a, our table was full. By the time we left, we didn't have nothing. I think the day before we didn't have anything left on the table. So we we're just demonstrating and talking to people which is so amazing, especially the background from the canyon. Just brings out a lot of more creativity that you can think of. I'm so glad that you remember that fond experience of your first time at Grand Canyon. And I know you guys do a lot of um, work yeah. with uh, natural materials that you actually process and um, create your own. Emerson, do you mind sharing a little bit about um, how you process the clay materials before you guys are even able to start shaping pots? Our clay is natural. Dorothy's just going to show you a picture of, of me at the at a clay mine site that we where we get our clay at. And that's me just getting the clay there. And it comes in natural color. And then when I do get it, it does look big chunks like this here. And then what I do with it here is I'll, I'll break it up to smaller pieces. If you can see inside this bucket, got smaller pebbles. With this, I will process into a five gallon bucket of water. I'll let that soak 
and stir it up every now and then. And once it gets all mushy, I'll put my hand in there, stir it around some more and use a stick sometimes. And then what I'm doing is making that, getting the clay rock just into the clay is real fine stuff. Then I'll do a straining. And the straining, I, again, I'll have five gallon buckets. I'm transferring the clay that's already been in the first bucket. I'll put a w regular window screen on top of the second bucket and just dump the mixture that's there into the second bucket. And what I'm doing is I'm taking out all the debris, rocks, sticks, uh, particles of coal, coal. And I'll do that for maybe about five or six times using the window screen. Uh, I'll usually do a double screen, maybe a triple screen. Then by then I should have mostly all the debris out. Then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to get all that clay in that bucket and then I'm going to get a, either a shear curtain or a painter's bag. Place that over the next clean bucket and then do the same thing. Pour that into the bucket and all I'm trying to get now is just the clay and that clay just drips down and into the bucket. And that's probably going to take maybe about another three or four more strainings. And I just want nothing but clay then. After that is done, I get a pant leg. Um, some of my old pants, Dorothy cuts up all the time. And <laughs> I'll tie off one end, the bottom of it. And that clay mixture that I have in a bucket, I'm gonna pour it inside that pant leg. Once that gets filled up, I'll tie that off. And then we'll take that over to a sand pile and just lay it in the sand. What it's doing there is all the water, the moisture is getting sucked up from the sand it just depends on the time of the year, whether it be summertime or wintertime. Summertime is going to probably take maybe half a day to a day for all the moisture to get sucked out. Winter, maybe two days at the most. Once that is done, I'll get the bag out of the sand and then check it and it's nice and moist. Moist and then it start ready to work. And when it's ready to work, then we can start molding. I'm mean, just taking out some clay that we already have. Um, like I said, there's yellow and gray that we work with. So this one here is the yellow clay. So it's nice and soft. So it's easy to, to work with. This is a little bit to us right now would be a little bit too soft. So it might a little bit harden a little bit more before it can start molding. And the gray is the same way, the same texture. So that's basically all it is used to process the clay, just buckets and water and my hands. And I know that Dorothy is in charge of doing some of um, painting materials of gathering and uh, processing. Dorothy, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you process the natural paints that you create? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, during, every year during springtime, we look out for uh, the plant called bee wheat. It's, it, grows in different areas. It doesn't always grow the same place um, year after year. Sometimes we'll pick it and then we try to go back to the same place and it's not there anymore. So almost kind of have to um, really hunt for it or look out for it. And, and so what we do is we'll bring the bee wheat home. Um, we don't, we cut it right above the root. So in case that it will grow the following year and we bring it home, we run it through water. We just want to take the dust and the sand off. And then outside our home, we have a makeshift grill where we put all the bee wheat into and we put what, top it off with water and let it boil um, in, a, in a big tub. Um, we do the whole process do a hard boil and every once in a while just looking at it uh, maybe give it a little stir never adding no more water in it, into it and what we want is we want we're sucking the juice out of that plant and the juice is more um as it as it continues to boil we're looking out for the darkness in the liquid um I've recently done two batches and I, one batch took me exactly 12 hours and the other one 18. Um, because with the second one, I only did the leaves. I was just experimenting. 
to see how long it would take. But the first batch, I did do the, uh, with the stem, cut it all up, which I normally do, and it took lesser time. So now I know to always add, just do the whole stem. Uh, so after continuing it to boil, um, when we feel, when I feel the juice is dark enough, then I'll take the brush out and toss that aside. It, it almost looks like colored greens once it's all boiled down. And then with a strainer, um, pour the liquid through that to get out any leaves or um, anything that's still into the juice. And then transfer it to a smaller pot and continue to boil it. Um, it just reduces all the way down and about maybe the 10th hour, really want to watch it. You, you get it at a simmering point and you, this is when you start to stir it to make sure it don't burn. Um, and if it burns, there goes your whole day of making paint. In the beginning, again, when I was learning, I did uh, try to make my own paint without the assistance of Mark because I wanted to show him I could do it and lo and behold I burned the whole batch um, and it when I burned it I always imagine it looking like the charcoal pencil I mean it was it was gone it was just like dust, dust. so now I learned how to um, uh, cook it so now I've been having success with it. Um, so about the 10th hour, we want to start stirring it. It's going to start to thicken almost like a taffy. And then when it's ready, then we just pour it on a corn husk. And this is how it looks. So this will take a while to dry, but when we're ready to paint, all we're going to do is clip off a piece of that and put it on our painting stone with some water and it'll go back into the uh, liquid. This is just a way to preserve it um, instead of putting, keeping it in liquid. So, so it doesn't, um, you know, like, uh, how do you want to say it? It doesn't dissolve, you know, it, it's better to keep it in this form. Um, some potters um, know how to make it and some don't. I mean, you really, any any part of the pottery making that you don't have, you can't finish it. So, you know, I made it my, one of my biggest life's lessons is to learn how to make paint because it's, a, it's crucial to the end when you fire and you want to make sure your paint sticks onto the pot. So the, it, this is one of the big, um, big lessons that, um, that it needs to be learned and how to cook it. So we've, we've had success with our paint. That's really nice to hear. Thanks for sharing, Dorothy. Um, so I know that you guys have several different steps that you go through and I thought Emerson might be able to take us through the first couple of maybe um, some of the coiling and shaping that you might do for some of your pots. So like I said, once the clay is ready and nice to the, the fillness that we get with the clay, I get a chunk of it and just make a ball. Start off with a ball. And what I do is I'll pat this down. And Dorothy explains this that she does this and makes it to a called a sausage patty. So she claims to make the best sausages. So actually all I'll do is just make it a little dish like so. And just like that. That's just the base. That's for the base for all our pots that we start. Doesn't matter how big or how small. From there, I'll grab some more clay and roll another ball. Then all I do is gonna make a coil, hand, just like so, pushing the clay between my hands. And once I get that coil done, I wanna continue with the coiling and, and depending on how big I'm gonna get the pot, I wanna make sure that all the coils are hopefully consistent, the same size and thickness. From there, what we do is we'll get this coil and pinch it on. Pinch it on, on the inside, all the way around till it meets up at the end. 
pick that off, pinch that together, and then bend this on the outside. The tools that we use for this, basically just our fingers and hand, and I can get a craft stick uh, purchased at Walmart for so much, a big bag. Prior to that, this is used on the outside, and I didn't bring no water, but I'm just gonna show kind of what I'm doing here, bending this together. So that's together. Then the garden gourd that we use is wet, and then we dip that in water, and then we use this on the inside to push that more together. And the clay, once it's good and soft, it can stretch. This clay will stretch quite a bit. So I start out with small pot. As you can see, I'm just trying to get larger now. And I'll continue this all the way till we're done, till I feel that either I want to stop at a certain size or a certain shape that I want. We'll continue to add coil after coil. So this basically is how I start the pot, and both of us, and it doesn't matter whether it's a traditional pot, maybe a water jug, or what I tend to do sometimes, make figures, and us, all our pots are started the same way. So that's basically the base of the clay, I mean the pot. So once it, then what, okay. we'll set it down and let it air dry. And so this is the crude looking one after it's been dried, it's a little basket. I believe our granddaughter made this one. So it looks just like that. So after that's done, then what we go to is the sanding process. All this crudeness will be sanded off and make it smooth. So once it gets smooth, smooth out, it looks something like this after all the, the bumps and little crevices are taken out. And then to make level, we will level it down, we'll sand it down at the bottom and I have a a level, basically a level, set it on top and then it shows you where it needs to go down a little bit more up and then I'll level it out. Okay. After that is done, then we do the polishing. And this is a polished pot already. All I do is get some a sponge, water, wipe it on the pot, and the river bed stone just blend it all in, all the way down to it's all completely done. The reason for that is so we can paint on it because if we try to paint on something like this one that's not polished, all the paint's gonna run into the crevices. The little, there's still little crevices in some of these pots here. And we don't want that to bleed into it. We wanna make a smooth line on it. So that's basically how we do our great start, start off the pots. Well, thanks for sharing Emerson. So that's, yeah, a great basis, but you've gotta finish it with some designs and then it's gotta be officially fired. Dorothy, would you like to share a little yeah. bit about um, any tools you might use for painting and the process of firing? Okay, so like I got done talking about the the paint that we made, we're gonna clip a piece of that off with some with some uh, put it put it on the stone with some water, and I already have this to show you here. I don't know if you can see. This is how it looks. That's what the paint that she's already put on there with water. With the bee wheat plant going on there with the water and the hematite stone, again, we have to look for. Well, go ahead and bind that all together like so until it gets thick. And when we feel that it's ready to paint, we'll just place it on the side and then paint. So this, this looks brown, but once it fires, fires it'll turn black and that's all the black that you see on the um, pots we also have different colors this this pot here has been fired um we start off like uh what looks like a coloring book with just the lines and then we'll go over it with um go and fill up the the areas where we want color so we have three different yellows, um, we have a white, and we also have a mauve color and a, a greenish color, and they're all clay colors. Those are only done by 
adding a bit of water to the uh, stone slab here and then and then grinding the clay color onto the uh, the stone here and no so this doesn't require any bee wheat or hematite then applying that paint to where you would like to fill it in so that's where we put it the yellow the the, the maroon color here will be i'm sorry it's small it but tiny it's a darker yellow color which will go on looking like this but it fires maroon um there's this light yellow color that goes on again exactly looking like this but it'll turn pink in the firing and then of course i showed you the white and then the the hematite and bee wit will be the black so the clay colors are only uh, used by adding water um, to them like i said no bee wheat or hematite this is where kind of people get mixed up i get asked a lot of questions about the the colors um, because some of them think they're acrylic, but we don't use acrylic. They're all from the mesas where we, where we pick them. So once the pot is all um, painted and ready to go, then uh, Emerson is usually the one that- The fire god. <laughs> that will go out and start the firing. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, go ahead and talk about that. After, after we get all the pots that we have painted and they're ready to be fired, we're going to do a preheating. And then the preheating helps bake on the, the pot, the paint. I'll go outside. I have a makeshift um, fire pit consisting of just railroad ties, uh, a canopy type covering with plywood. I have a cinder block platform about uh, three by four, and I'm going to burn fire on top of that. My wood that I'm going to burn has to be completely dry. If there's any moisture, it's going to cause some smoking, and it cause some crackling or some popping. So I want that completely dry. Then, of course, we get sheep manure. We, we have to purchase the sheep manure from our neighbors, the Navos, because they have most of all the sheep. And what they're doing is clearing out their manure or their sheep pen. And there's one particular man that we purchased the manure from and roughly about $100, $120 a truckload. But sometimes we'll barter for bread and picky, which they love. And they come in big chunks like this. So what I'm going to do when it gets dry, and this has to be completely dry, no moisture at all, because it'll cause some major smoke damage if it does, if it's wet. So something like this, I'll chop it in half, break it into smaller pieces. And what I'm doing there is making it, getting a whole tub full. Uh, it just depends on how many pots that we have to fire. If we have multiple smaller ones, we can do them all at once. If there's anything that's larger, maybe um, something about wide and maybe that big, we'll fire that by itself. But those are still, this will still take a lot of manure to, to burn. So what I do, I'll get a uh, 55 gallon drum lid or a barbecue grill or something that's gonna, some type of metal that's gonna be able to withstand some heat. Mm -hmm. We'll line it all with pottery shards. So the pots that I'm gonna fire, I'm gonna sit on top of that plate on top of the shards. Once the fire is burnt to a good thickness, um, say about that much thicker ash all the way across, I'm gonna put that metal plate on top of the, the ashes itself. And prior to that, I sprinkle some of the uh, manure on the bottom so it starts already burning. And this will burn really hot. So I wanna get that going, put that plate on there. Then once on, when it's there, we're gonna start covering all the plate and the pots that need to be fired with more pottery shards. So it kind of constructs like a beehive all the way around it. We start stacking the manure around the, the base of the, the ash bed and just build it up again, covering up to a beehive type. And that'll start, that'll burn. It'll start burning, especially if it's really dry. It'll sometimes it'll just combust real quickly and it'll burn for a good hour. 
cool down for the next five. So basically our fire consists of about, takes about six, seven hours at the most. When it's burning, we'll stand out there and listen to the fire itself because when we first started firing pots, we were losing a lot of pots due to breakage and popping because there was something that we didn't know what was going on. And Mark had finally asked Dorothy what, how we're doing our firing show and said, well, you're not preheating. So, and that kind of sucks up most of the moisture already in the pot, even though they've been dry, kind of helps, makes it more stronger. So after that, after so many years of trial and error, we're starting to get more uh, success rate. So I think our success rate is probably about maybe right now, let's say 97% success. We haven't been making pots since the pandemic started um, we just there recently fired twice and those are just pots that we had sitting on on the shelf as i explained earlier and those some of them did pop yeah. um, i don't know maybe they got tired of waiting to get done <laughs> but that's basically our, our once the fire is done after it's cooled off then we reverse the process take off all the manure ash remove the shards and i will explain that this part is usually like Christmas because we know what we put in, but we don't know what we're gonna get out. And there's a lot of time on the paint that we see and the fire blushing that causes from just the heat itself actually start forming right before our eyes. And we, that's one part of the demonstration that a lot of folks don't get to see is the fire. So Dorothy had did a, a PowerPoint display, which we used a couple of times at the Canyon and people are just amazed at what, how we actually do the whole process from start to finish. And a lot of folks think that we use an electric kiln, but we don't. Ours are just new done. Well, thank you for sharing that process, uh, Dorothy and Emerson. It's detailed in every step and you've got to be careful with how you manage everything, but I'm glad your success rate is going up. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit, maybe Dorothy, if you tell us a little bit about how you connect to Grand Canyon, either personally or culturally, and how that um, is reflected in some of the pots that you make. Well, um, culturally, the, you know, we were, we're all told as young people, maybe from our, our grandparents or our uncles, that Grand, Grand Canyon is a very spiritual place to us because uh, we came up from the third world that we were into the fourth world. We were almost like given a chance to be better, better people and stewards to the land. And so there's a, a place there in Grand Canyon where I, I don't know and probably many folks don't know where we the hole is that we came out of can't see Papuni. And so that that's, you know, the the big tie to how we're, we're uh, joined in that way to the Grand Canyon. Also, um, back then, you know, the ancestors, they lived there until they were ready to start moving around. And they went to find, they, they moved around and went to different areas to um, start making their own homes, you know, like maybe going toward the mesas or down south or going east, west, you know, north. And that's how, you know, they started branching off. Um, so culturally, you know, that's how we're, we're, we're connected. Um, I'm pretty sure there's probably other stories that, that weren't told to me. Um, personally, I always knew that Grand Canyon was there and I never realized how short of a trip it was until we got asked to go demonstrate there the first time. And I thought it was going to be a long drive, you know, until we actually took it. And I was really like, wow, it's just right here and we never really came over here. And I don't, I can't remember how many demonstrations we've done, but being there the first time during the time it snowed, it it just overwhelmed me. It was so beautiful with the snow all over, you know, and I, I, I actually just cried and just, 
it, it, I got overwhelmed, you know, by the beauty of it. And this, it, I mean, it was just nature, you know, nature's creation. And after going there so many times now, um, it, it feels like I get rejuvenated every time, you know, just being in that clean, crisp air and watching people, observing people by the ahs and the oohs of it and, you know, hearing them express how beautiful it is, you know, it makes me, it makes me feel good to know that my tie there is more personal than them, you know, something that they'll never, they'll never go through or understand or don't know about, you know, and you want to tell them, but, you know, you just sit back and listen to them and, um, you know, just makes me happy to know that they're, you know, what they're seeing is, is going to be an embedded memory of their trip there. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I get that connection like that, the spiritual connection there. Well, thank you for sharing, Dorothy. And Emerson, would you like to share anything about a personal connection that you have to the canyon or, or anything that um, Dorothy didn't mention culturally that you'd like to mention? Well, it's basically the same, the story of how Hopi arrived. But as I look at it, and it's true that all these natural wonders that we have in the world, and to know that Grand Canyon was one of them, and it's true that, and I think it's probably true for a lot of folks that we have all these national parks and sites that are available to us, but we never take advantage of it until something happens or you get asked to go somewhere. And I've I've seen quite a bit of land because prior to my law enforcement career, I was doing wildland firefighting and I actually did some firefighting on the canyon on the north of him. Um, but got dropped off on one point that was burning by the helicopter and we stayed out there for like three or four days and then got flown back out. But just seeing the canyon in real life person and knowing that that's kind of where our ancestors came from. And to know that it's just a natural wonder that was created by the wind, the water, and just the natural elements, which kind of connects me that I can create something with my own hands. And especially being there doing the demonstrating, it, it just brings a lot mm -hmm. more inspiration and creativity to it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just a wonderful place to be, especially when you're doing the craft work and um, meeting the people. Like Dorothy said, there was there was a lot of folks that come through all the times so we've been there, and they're just amazed at what we're doing. And even though we don't understand some of the language they're speaking, you can actually feel know what they're talking about. <laughs> Well, that was wonderful to hear about your ties to your ancestral homeland here at Grand Canyon and those experiences that you had when you came back to visit Grand Canyon. And I'm just wondering if you guys would have um, a moment that you might be able to share that comes to mind, a pivotal moment as your time as an artist that really made you think about this is worth it or this is a memory that I will always have that I, I made it as an artist. Yeah, I, I really... I really, um, when I thought about this question, it took me to when the day, you know, that I was told that I was going to be put in the Indian art magazine that year during the Indian market back in 2001 for, you know, that year I was one of the top 10 artists to to, to one of the top 10 emerging artists to to seek out and after all those many years of my starting with mark um and all his teachings you know with with how far i be i came and to and the first thing was to be one of the top 10 you know it was like wow um it, it was I had to sit down and I had to, I, I of course I got emotional and um, I, 
I had to call Mark and he came to my house and it, it was like a, uh, like being a star, you know, um, we cried and he encouraged me and some more and he advised me, talked to me and, you know, it was just one of those things all of a sudden that happened. And it, and after that, I had a lot of, um, a lot more pivotal moments, you know, when I got asked to be in uh, books. So we're in three books. Um, we did a video um, and just, just things like that started to come about. But during 2001, when we were, I was hitting my peak with my art, um, that's when the Twin Towers crashed. So I felt like I crashed with it. I had a little bit of fame right there for a little bit. And I came tumbling down with it too. So I always remember that time, you know, um, I was, I hit it and I crashed. <laughs> so that's my pivotal moment, you know, with, with um, my art. And I was like, wow, this happened. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, but, um, that's dear to me, you know, that's to my heart. You know, we all get humbled at moments in our life, and I'm so glad that you've been able to make so much progress um, and just some amazing pieces that people have really treasured. Um, Emerson, do you have a pivotal moment in your career that you would like to share um, that's just a memory that stands out for you? I think for me, being a police officer majority of my, my lifetime and traveling with firefighting and uh, law enforcement, seeing all the whole con different con parts of the country. I think the most pivotal time for me was when I obtained a few pieces of my grandmother's pots. I actually came back, getting ready for Indian market one year and um, Dorothy's the one that made the connection with one of the gallery owners and he's, he said, I have, might be one of your relatives. And he showed it to her and showed, she showed me the picture. And it was, it had my grandmother's name on there, Eleanor. So she had a canteen and two ladles. So I made the connection with him and I said, hey, I got some pots. We want to make a deal. So I want to take all those three. So I did make the deal with him and I brought them home. And I gave one of the ladles to my dad and just knowing that these are her pots that she actually made when I was growing up. I may have seen her make them, don't know for sure, but those were some of the things that she did a lot. The canteens, the ladles, um, she made what she called pencil holders, ashtray. But these are just some of the things that I know that she made. And, as with all of us, we have our own signature on our pots, and hers was on the back of that canteen. So that is most treasured items that I have. And we had a display in our shop after we obtained them, and I don't know how many times somebody wanted to buy that canteen. I just, I just had to put a, a sign up there, not for sale. <laughs> well, that. That is my most pivotal because it brings back, you know, the teachings that she shared, shared with me and that I know that I have something that she made. Well, it's great to hear that you've been able to come full circle and make your own pots as well from what you've learned from your grandmother. Um, I think our final question that we have today is, do you have any words of wisdom that you would like to share with other artists? Yeah, never give up. Never give up. <laughs> Because I've, I've been there. I've been there at a point where frustration sets in and, you know, you don't want to continue to do the artwork anymore. But just like what happened to me overnight, you know, boom, you're, you're top 10. And that, that says a lot. You know, you think you might not be seen, your art might not be um, seen out there in the world or being sought after but little do you know you know that these things happen and 
and even if a, a lot of times I hear people get upset when their work or their design is uh, copied. And in the beginning, I kind of went through that phase, but the way I see it now is that even if your work is copied or your design, be proud of that because the design that you put on whatever you were making was your creation and it was good enough for somebody to copy and it means more to you than it does to them so that's that's my advice is never give up and keep keep those hands moving we were all gifted with with a talent that some some of us don't have and some of us have you know it's anything cooking singing you know, we, we all have talents and we just need to uh, reach further inside of us to bring it out. Same thing for me, but and like Dorothy said, if you have a design that someone copied, you know, it does mean a lot more to you than them, but you never know. There's somebody out there will probably see that same creation and say, hey, I know where that came from. And I never thought that the pots that I've made so far, someone would actually see them and, you know, contact me and say, hey, I have your pot I bought from wherever, or I've seen you at some demonstration, I've got one of your pots, can you do me another one? And those are those are times when you try to start thinking back, wow, what, what, what did I make or <laughs> what did I do? But once you get noticed, I mean, it, just continue on, just don't give up. Share yeah. your talent, your kids, grandkids, mm -hmm. and encourage everybody. I know there's frustration in any artwork that we do, because sometimes I always say there's never a perfect pot out there. There's always some imperfection, but we're not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> and stay humble with your artwork. Yep. Stay humble. Thank you. Could you guys have anything else that you would like to add? Well, uh -huh. just for as far as this pandemic is concerned. Just do the best you can. I know it's frustrating, it's frustrating for us, but we're glad that we're actually kind of getting back into the field of making pots. We kind of put a damper on both of us, and I think for everybody out there. But we're, like I said, we're getting hit by just doing a little of the pots that we had, finish them up, and put it out there on Dorothy's Facebook page, and we saw what we've had. Mm -hmm. So it kind of encouraged us to keep on going. Yeah, I just want to thank the um, Grand Canyon for um, the interview and continuing to have faith in us to do this and us having faith in you to Bring us help back. us help us to um, get our artwork out there in the world because there's so many people that don't know what we do. You know, there's so many types of art and I just want to thank you for this, uh, for hosting us, and um, good luck to to everyone, to the artists, and to Grand Canyon. And I'm sure we'll be back, you know, maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> For now.
And Emerson, I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge, experience, and skills with us today. It is an honor to have you be a part of our cultural demonstration program, and we appreciate your efforts in helping more people feel connected to Grand Canyon, its history, and its spirit. Thank you so much, Grace. And thank you, Dorothy and Emerson. We really appreciate you joining us today and talking about your crafts. Grand Canyon's cultural demonstrator program is made possible support and grants from Grand Canyon Conservancy and Art Place America. To learn more about the artisans in this program, go to greencanyon.org forward slash demonstrators. Stay tuned for more history behind the arts features on both Grand Canyon National Park and Grand Canyon Conservancy's social media pages. Thank you.